Now, uh, the first impairment in the optical fiber is uh, attenuation. You send some power at the input of the optical fiber, you do not get all the power out because there are some losses in the fiber. And the losses in the fiber are classified to one is absorptive loss, the other one is radiative loss. Absorptive loss is where the energy gets absorbed by the system. So, it is not available, right? The system absorbs energy. Whereas, radiative loss is where the guided light actually, so if this is the core, the guided light gets coupled into the cladding and just escapes out as a uh, radiation mode. What is the radiation mode? We will talk about, but for now, let us understand that it is as if you have a angle of incidence at the core cladding interface which is less than the critical angle. So, it escapes into the cladding and it escapes outside. So, in that sense you cannot say that it is lost, it is lost from the guided core. Okay. So, energy is not lost, it is available outside. So, the two classes of uh, uh, losses are in one case the energy is completely lost, you cannot retrieve it, whereas in radiative loss in principle it is available outside, even though it is it may be completely useless to have it uh, outside. Okay. So, uh, in now, now looking at absorptive loss, what are the mechanisms by which uh, absorptive loss happens? So, we are going to now talk about only glass fibers. Uh, plastic fibers have very limited use and glass fibers, the manufacturing uh, volumes are so large that the cost of a glass fiber is much smaller these days. So, you could uh, practically use glass fibers for most of uh, your applications. Uh, so, in a glass fiber, what are the causes of absorption? You are doping the uh, fiber, so the dopant can uh, have some absorptions, but most of the cases the dopants are transparent, so there is no material intrinsic absorption there or it is very limited. More than that, what is the fiber made of? Before even we talk about dopant absorption, we should talk about silica absorption, right. Silica itself, SiO2 is a molecule, the molecule has one silicon atom and two oxygen atoms and they are bound with each other with some kind of bond and each of these chemical bonds you know that they have resonances. So, if you are in if you are uh, going in with frequency which is close to the resonant frequency the absorption is going to be large right. So, that is characteristic of the bond between the SI and the O2. So, that is one reason for absorption. And it turns out that SiO2 has absorption in the infrared wavelength and infrared wavelength is what we are going to use for communication. So, you have to be careful about which infrared wavelength are we using because if the bond strength, if you are incident with a frequency corresponding to the resonant frequency of your bond. Now, bond uh, when you talk about molecule there are atomic resonance, there are molecular resonances also. Right. The atom itself has resonant frequency, the molecule will have its resonant frequency. So, you have to avoid both the resonant frequencies and then you have to avoid the uh, you know the impurities that may come up when you are trying to fabricate the fiber. It could be from the dopants, it could be from the fabrication process, all that will result in uh, loss. So, the difference between again I will repeat radiative loss and absorptive loss is that the energy is absorbed by the material it may get converted from uh, photon to phonon, it is why what happens to the absorbed energy? It goes, it gets lost as vibration in the material. So, that energy is not something that you can retrieve from the material. Okay. So, the reasons for uh, absorptive loss are one is intrinsic absorptive loss like what we said electronic vibrational resonances of uh, the molecule which is IR uh, absorption of silica. The second one is extrinsic which is coming because of the fabrication the, and uh, the typical typical the most typical uh, contaminant in the fabrication is uh, hydroxyl ions right. These hydroxyl forms a bond with silica. So, some of these oxygen gets replaced with OH minus and uh, one of the critical uh, processes uh, in the fiber manufacturing is to do the entire process. The, they do a chemical vapor deposition process. So, do the chemical vapor deposition process without contaminating 
with uh, OH. Where is the OH coming from in the process when they are doing the process? I mean atmosphere has OH minus, right. So, the moisture in the atmosphere can contaminate while the fiber is being fabricated and that needs to be avoided. And OH minus has a certain resonance and it will absorb at that resonant frequency. Okay, you want to avoid that. And some of the transition metals which are in the dopants, right. So, they also will have uh, uh, a large absorption. So, when we uh, trace the history of uh, evolution of fiber optics, we said from 1970s when Kao first said that glass fiber can be used for communication to the time where uh, you know Corning made the first fiber to the time where I told you that the Japanese made the fiber with minimum uh, loss. The evolution was in um, finding out a chemical process, optimal chemical process which will have minimum of this extrinsic uh, loss. Intrinsic loss you cannot avoid because the fiber is to be made of SiO2. So, whatever SiO2 will absorb you will have to live with it, but the attempt was to minimize the extrinsic loss ok. To how do you make a fiber with minimum contamination and it turns out that whatever process was frozen. Uh, so, they tried different kinds of chemical processes whatever process was frozen 30 years ago is the same process we are continuing even. Uh, today to get this uh, minimum um, uh, loss. Now, we talk about radiative loss. So, where is this radiative loss coming from now? Bending yes, when you bend the fiber there is some loss and when you bend the fiber it may not satisfy the total internal reflection. So, it is available, uh, it is available uh, at the output. So, it is as far as the transmission is concerned you are losing the you are losing that uh, energy. Uh, now, bend itself it could be macro bend because you know when you lay the fiber you would have bent it somewhere at the corner of the room and things like that or it could be micro bend in the sense that there could be some local uh, stresses that are created in the system uh, when you are drawing the fiber which gets frozen into the system. So, there could be a micro bending loss. What else? Rayleigh scattering. What is Rayleigh scattering? Rayleigh scattering is a reason for uh, the sky to be blue ok. In your high school you said you have learned why is the sky blue. You say that there are these small particles in the atmosphere very tiny uh, you know moisture or other particles in the atmosphere which scatter light which change the direction of light. And the scattering is a wavelength uh, dependent phenomena. In fact, the scattering is inversely proportional to lambda power 4, right. So, longer is the wavelength, smaller is the scattering, it is inversely proportional to lambda power 4. So, Rayleigh scattering is something which uh, you cannot avoid because SiO2 itself is a molecule which is smaller than Rayleigh. So, there are in when you talk about scattering, there are two types of scattering. One is the Rayleigh scattering, the other one is a Mie scattering. Me scattering is a phenomena where uh, the mechanism is completely different, we will not go into the details. If the scatterer is of very large size, you call it me scattering. Now, when you say large, large compared to what? Large compared to wavelength of light. If the scatterer is small when compared to wavelength of light, you say it is Rayleigh scattering, ok. So, you typically do not have me scattering because uh, the fiber drawing process is really uh, optimized such that there are no big scatterers in the system, it is all small scatterers. So, the first reason for radiative is uh, Rayleigh scattering and the second one is waveguide imperfections. You make the waveguide and there are small micro bends that are you know uh, the, the surface is non uniform somewhere the there is a corrugation. So, locally the angle is not satisfying the critical angle and so you will have uh, energy that is radiated out right. So, these are the two types of extrinsic loss or rather the radiative losses that is happening in a fiber. Now, talking more about uh, Rayleigh scattering as I said it is because of the density variations of dimensions less than wavelength. So, any density variation it does not have to be a particle even the when you say density it means the optical density. So, if there are refractive index variations in the system which is of the order of dimensions of uh, less than wavelength you will have Rayleigh scattering. Uh, the strength of the inverse scattering as I said is inversely proportional to the fourth power of wavelength and that brings the optimal choice of the carrier to be in the 1550 nanometer window. So, in fact, the model for Rayleigh scattering in a single mode fiber 
is a commercial single mode fiber is this the alpha which is your loss is alpha naught lambda naught by lambda power 4 right. So, this alpha naught is uh, uh, 1.7 dB per kilometer this is for a standard single mode fiber this is we, we this is an empirical relation one cannot probably derive this uh, relation, but we know that it is proportional to 1 by lambda power 4 ok. So, which means that as lambda increases can you sketch how the scattering loss is going to look like scattering is going to scattering is inversely proportional to lambda power 4 the more is your scattering larger is your loss right. So, as your lambda increases 1 by lambda power 4 will decrease. So, scattering will decrease. So, the loss will decrease. So, it is going to look like this and this slope is 1 by lambda power 4. So, people have done this. So, this relation is coming up from the fit for this curve measured curve ok, but this is a useful relation because you know if if you know the loss of your fiber you know you have only one color to measure with you measure the loss of the fiber at let us say 15 15 nanometer and tomorrow you want to know you know if I change the wavelength to some other color what is the loss going to be this is a nice empirical relation to use. But can it go down infinitely which means that I should use the longest possible wavelength then why do we say that the optimal choice is 15 50 what happens after 15 50. Uh, OH absorption actually comes somewhere around 1300, hydroxyl absorption comes around 1300. So, if you have a fiber which is contaminated with uh, hydroxyl, you will have something like this, a bump like this, which means that at that frequency that that corresponds to the resonant frequency of OH. But the resonant frequency of silica itself will start around 2200 nanometer or something which means that because of this uh, you know molecular vibrational resonances of silica molecule itself beyond this you will start having increased loss. Most of the textbooks only show up to here up to this point they do not tell what really happens after that actually what really happens is beyond this about about 2000 uh, nanometer sorry this is not 200 2000 nanometer the loss actually increases it increases because silica starts absorbing beyond that which means there is a sweet spot where your uh, loss is minimum and that is your 1550 nanometer window as a window means there is a range of wavelengths that we typically use in that uh, with a center of around 1500 or 1550 nanometer ok that is called the C band of communication conventional band C stands for conventional it is not like uh, terminology in radars in radar uh, communication C band stands for 8 to 12 gigahertz is uh, C band we are not talking about that here C band stands for 1520 to 1560 nanometer can convert into terahertz it will be some 190 189 terahertz to 196 terahertz or something like that. Uh, that is about Rayleigh scattering and this is the more accurate picture of the loss versus wavelength. So, initially people started using uh, this wavelength range because uh, diodes and uh, receivers were available at this wavelength range, transmitters and receivers were very easily available at uh, this wavelength range. So, that is the first window, we will still use this for short distance communication because these are still low cost transmitters and uh, uh, receivers, but if you see the attenuation that is roughly about uh, 2, 2.5 dB per kilometer. C band is what we are using 1550, 1530 to 1560 nanometer for communication and beyond that actually it is like this. So, the figure is not truly indicative actually it starts sloping and it goes higher like this. This is where we do all the long distance communication. There is another band which uh, got popular which is still popular for short distance communication because again uh, because of the availability of the source and the uh, transmitter and the receiver which is O band which is in the region 1300 nanometer ok. So, 
if you take fiber optic communication they will either be in this 800 nanometer window or in the 1300 nanometer window or in the 1550 nanometer window. These are the typical windows for communication. Of course, uh, you can think of a fiber where you are transporting all these colors simultaneously. Uh, the reason why E band for instance is not very good is because that is where the OH absorption is. But these days people have made fibers which are called as dry fibers meaning they have perfected the fabrication process such that there is no uh, OH absorption. So, that you can get it something like flat here, uh, but of course, uh, the challenge is to use to, to find transmitters and receivers and not just transmitters and receivers amplifiers which will work in this wavelength. Right? So, that is little difficult. Uh, similarly, there is this S band which is below 1500 and there is an L band which is above 1600 above 1560. Uh, so, tomorrow's generation uh, maybe 10 years down the line if our you know available bandwidth is not sufficient one approach is to use to make uh, transmitters to make receivers to make amplifiers work in E band, uh, S band, L band and so on. Right? But currently these are the bands that are used and as I said earlier greater than 1700 it is limited by infrared absorption. Okay. Now, uh, other than this uh, uh, Rayleigh scattering and waveguide imper imperfections as we discussed earlier there is this bending loss. Now, bending loss as I said earlier one is macro bending where you are actually bending the fiber and if the radius of curvature of the bend is uh, r you can bend it at different radius of curvature. Uh, the loss is proportional to exponential minus r by r c where r c is a constant and it is given as a divided by root of n 1 square minus n 2. So, it is dependent on the acceptance angle how much loss that you have is decided by the acceptance angle. This is again an empirical relation. So, it is useful for you to when you are running an experiment for instance bending loss experiment you are trying to measure what is the loss for different radius of curvature of the bend your loss should fit into this kind of an exponential curve essentially saying that your loss because of bending as a function of radius of curvature will be an exponential uh, relation and the rate at which this is falling is decided by your RC and that RC itself is decided by your numerical aperture. Okay. We are not deriving all this because most of it is empirical relations. Okay. Uh, so, it turns out that when the radius of curvature is greater than phi mm you know it is an exponential relation so is because the radius of if the radius of curvature is greater than phi mm the bending loss is negligibly small because of this exponential relation. So, so long as you keep your radius of curvature greater than phi mm a standard single this is all for a standard commercial single mode fiber. What is the single mode fiber we will talk about, but this is the standard fiber that we use in communication. Uh, the other one is of course, micro bending loss where you are not physically bending it this micro bending loss is the local stress that is created because of the formation of the glass. So, you cannot help it this will be there. Right? and that will be decided by the fabrication process and this will get included in the total attenuation. Okay. Uh, when you lay the fiber link in addition to that there will be a connector loss, there will be a splice loss and so on. So, connector loss I mean every time you make a connection you have to make sure that the connector loss is as close to 0 dB as possible and if your ferrules are not clean you will realize that the core of the fiber is only 10 micron. If you have a dust particle of the size 10 micron, you are completely obstructing light. Right? So, it is that is why it is very important to keep cleaning your connectors every time you make a connection to make a fiber optic link. So, there is a, a committee consulting committee for uh, telecom uh, recommendation. Uh, it, it says that the bending induced loss at 1550 of 100 turns of a fiber wound with a radius of 3.75 centimeter should be less than 1 dB. This is what is acceptable. So, which is why when you do a bending loss uh, measurement of a bending loss you will always do a large number of turns because as you increase a number of turns the bending loss is going to be higher. Ideally you should be doing if you were to follow CCE ITT recommendation you have to bend you have to make 100 turns before measuring the bending loss. 
So, when you know when fiber manufacturers uh, declare these uh, numbers, they ought to have done uh, measurements such that they are making 100 turns with a standard uh, jig of radius 3.75 centimeter and they should prove that the loss without bending and with bending is less than 1 dB that will qualify the standards. All right, question there are two fibers and they have two different numerical apertures. Let us say one fiber has a high numerical aperture and the other fiber has a low numerical aperture. So, let us call this as fiber 1 and fiber 2. You do not know any other information about this fiber. Can you guess which one has a larger scattering loss? Scattering loss we are talking about Raleigh scattering, we are talking about radiative losses. Which one do you think has a larger uh, Raleigh scattering loss at the same color, at the same wavelength? Uh, uh, let us assume that the light extraction ability from the fiber is the same, right? Then do you feel that both of them will have the same loss? Actually, no. How do you increase the NA? Changing the refractive index. How do you change the refractive index? by adding dopants. So, if you want to have a large Na, the dopant concentration will be high and more your dopant concentration is more your impurities are, because dopant is an impurity as far as the scattering process is concerned. More is your impurity, more is your scattering. Okay, if you keep the core as the same and change the cladding, no that is not what we discussed. We said typically how is a fiber made? A fiber is made with core you increase the refractive index, clad you reduce the refractive index that is how a normal fiber process happens. You now, you are talking about a speciality fiber, a special fiber where you are, you are not increasing the core refractive index at all, maybe in that case it is different, but for regular fibers high Na means large loss. Okay. One more question, attenuation is 0.2 dB, this is much easier, 0.2 dB per kilometer, this is a standard number. How far can the signal of 0 dBm be transmitted, so that the power of the receiver is at least 100 microwatt? 0 dBm, 100 microwatt is what in dBm? Minus 10 dBm. So, total loss you can accept is, so loss is 10 dB, because it is in decibel I can take a difference and that will be the loss both are in that is a benefit of doing everything in dBm, which is why all your calculations is better you do it in dBm. So, that loss becomes loss gain becomes subtractions additions and each kilometer has a 0.2 dB loss. So, the length it can survive is 10 divided by 0.2. So, it can survive 50 kilometers. It simply means that after 50 kilometer length your power gets lost by or the, the power what remains is only one tenth of what you had launched. So, even though you are saying fiber is an ideal way of communicating, it has large bandwidth and so on, just after 50 kilometers and 50 kilometer is not a very long length as far as you know uh, fiber communication is concerned. You are talking about submarine links which are at 3000 kilometers. Now, imagine uh, your power got lost and this is after the best possible process that you could have for a fiber. And this 0.2 dB kilo per kilometer is flowed, or that's that's you cannot decrease it further. In fact, people have done probably up to 0.16 dB per kilometer. The race is to between the different fiber manufacturers. The patents for different fiber manufacturers is to make that 0.16 to 0.159 or 0.158 uh, uh, dB per kilometer. Because every fraction of dB they are gaining, you can increase the transmission distance by that. Uh, number, right? but you are seeing that one tenth of our power is lost even after 50 kilometer fiber, which means that in a link you cannot go all the way 3000 kilometers without doing something in between, which is what makes, uh, which is what brings in the requirement of amplifiers, you have to make up cover up for the lost power or you have to have repeaters, you receive and you do a modulation again and do a transmission. 